Uh, welcome, welcome everybody to our, our Sunday service. Um, we're glad that you have joined us. We hope that you're well, um, sitting at home, whatever platform you've joined us in, whether it's Zoom, uh, Facebook, or YouTube. Uh, we just, we just want to welcome you, and um, we pray that technology goes well and uh, everything turns out great and the sound is great. Um, we're just going to open up in a word of prayer, and then the team will lead us in, in worship. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we, we thank you that we have been able to gather once again, even though it's not in a physical sense of all us being together, we still have means in which we can uh, meet and have fellowship together. So I thank you for that, Lord. Lord, I know that we are halfway through the, the second lockdown and it can be a difficult time for some of us, some more so than others. Uh, but Lord, we have uh, great assurance. We can take great assurance in the sovereignty of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hebrew 1, 3 tells us that he upholds the universe by the power of his word. And we saw that power of his word when he was on this earth through um, his healing, healing people through his word, casting out demons, um, pronouncing forgiveness, uh, even controlling nature itself by his word. But the deeper reality of that is that the universe itself is being upheld by the power of the word of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is whom we worship. This is whom we gather this morning and worship. It's not just a, a wise man. It's not just a teacher. It's not just a scholar. It's not just a set of words or principles or precepts. It's not just religion. We are here this morning to worship the God of the universe. So Lord, thank you once again for this opportunity. Lord, sometimes it can be really difficult to, to connect in worship through a screen. But, but I pray, Lord, that you help us to connect to the reality of who you are. In your name we pray, Lord. Amen. Amen. Team. Thank Brilliant. You. Thanks, Johnny. And... Um, yeah, it gets more and more surreal each week, it seems. Sometimes um, we're, we're here belting out these songs to an empty room. Um, but it's helpful to remind us that we will all be worshipping together at the same time. And, and along with us, there'll be thousands, if not millions, of other Christians across the country and across the world worshipping this morning and are joining them, all the angels of heaven as well. And so as we worship in our own spaces this morning, uh, let us really... Uh, celebrate and rejoice knowing that we we do not worship alone but we worship uh, an almighty god with with all of his creation so let's uh, stand sit whatever you want to do um, and let's worship together <laughs>
would you just pray that prayer this morning, that our whole lives would be lived in a place of worship to you. And so will you take what we offer you this morning, and Lord, will it be pleasing to your ears. Amen. move away from it again. Sometimes people are a bit like that too. When people are out at night you very often see them hanging around underneath street lamps or near buildings that are all lit up because people prefer to be in the light than in the dark. Who can remember the memory verse from the light party? Can you say it with me? God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. I've got another verse for today and it's from Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 3. It says, Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. God's light attracts people to him. People want to come closer to God's light because, well, it's just so beautiful. But what's really exciting is that if you're a Christian, God's light is in you. Jesus once said to his disciples, you are the light of the world. And that means you and me too. When you're going about whatever you normally do in your day, at school, at work, at gymnastics or football or band practice or shopping or at the park or whatever it is, just even putting the rubbish out on the street. You have God's light in you because of his Holy Spirit living inside of you. Jesus said, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they might see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. When people see God's light in you, then they'll be attracted to it too. And they'll be attracted to God, who is the source of it. And then maybe they'll come to know God for themselves as well. And wouldn't it be so cool if some of your friends came to know Jesus for themselves because they saw God's light in you? It really is one of the most amazing feelings in the world ever when you help your friends to come to know Jesus. So when you're going about your day, whatever it is that you're doing, remember, don't hide God's light in you because you never know who's going to see it and who will be attracted to it and who will eventually come to know for themselves the God who is light. In my wrestling and in my doubts, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Whoa. You are the peace in my troubled sea. In the silence you won't let go In the questions your truth will hold Your great love will lead us through You are the peace in my troubled sea Whoa. You are the peace in my troubled sea
advancing. My God's love will lead us through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Whoa. You are the peace in my troubled sea. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness, I will follow you, oh, my lighthouse, my lighthouse, I will trust the promise, you will carry me safe to shore, safe to shore. sing those notes and, and reach that high that you that you do because uh, it's a really catchy song but I can't sing so uh, anyway um, notices uh, today is uh, communion um, so if you haven't already prepared uh, for that um, at some stage um, we'll be doing it at the end of the service so you have ample time to get to get it ready um, but try and be quick try not to miss any of the service um, this evening, Sundays at 7, uh, John's going to be going through Colossians, um, so I encourage everybody um, to join in. Uh, we've got Zoom, Zoom meetings afterwards. I'm on that camera, not that one. Uh, Zoom meeting uh, afterwards, breakout rooms, so join in uh, for some time of fellowship. Uh, prayer meeting, there's a prayer meeting this Wednesday. There was one last Wednesday, but there is this one this Wednesday, uh, so please... Uh, join in again um, for that and then we've got the church meeting on the 26th of this month um, so look out for further details on time and things like that um, offering so um, I know the ways in which we can do offering is reduced but there is still the the way of um, bank transfers so I'd encourage everybody just to continue to give, even in these uncertain times. Um, the New Testament speaks about generosity and us being in generous. Um, so I'd encourage you to do that. We're just going to go into a time of prayer, uh, just for a moment before we go into second um, song. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you, Lord. Firstly, I just want to thank you for the, the people that I've given, Lord. Lord, uh, according to um, 2 Corinthians 9, uh, verse 6, I think, it says those who um, sow sparingly will reap sparingly, but those who sow bountifully will reap bountifully. Uh, so, Lord, I pray for those that have been generous in their giving, that they will receive um, a greater reward. Lord, we just want to spend some time together as we, we pray as a community, uh, praying for one another, Lord. 
Lord, I think about the, the, the prayer lists that get sent out every week. And Lord, I thank you for those lists that get sent out and the, and the needs that are made known to this community. Lord, you, in, you instructed us to not be anxious. Um, and Paul even echoes those words later on in, in, in Philippians. And he says, don't be anxious about anything, but uh, by everything in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. And so, Father, that's what we do. We take a, we take a moment, even though it's an extensive list of all different kinds of needs. But Lord, as, as one body, as, as, as one community, we bring these, these before you, dear God. And Lord, we think about those people that need uh, healing, that they may receive healing in Jesus' name, Lord. We pray for those that are looking for a breakthrough, that that breakthrough might come in Jesus' name. That, Lord, we're thinking about those who are in a time of mourning, for they have, have lost someone that they, were, that they were seeking comfort, and we pray for the comforter to come and comfort them, Lord. Lord, we think of those of our family members and our friends who are lost. Lord, our husbands, our wives, dear God, our children, it's not just a matter of fact that they don't come to church. The reality is even greater. They're, they're dead in their sin, they're lost in their trespasses, separate from you Lord Father we take a moment to think of uh, to think of these these people whom we love but yet are lost our children have been raised in a church but have gone their separate ways Father I pray that you'd call them home the Father you'd work in, in the hearts of those whom we love that you would change their heart of stone into a heart of flesh, a heart that is responsive, responsive to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh Lord, that you would have mercy on those who we are praying for. Father, for, for all the needs and, and requests that we make known, Lord, Lord, I, I pray, Lord, that you would, you, would, you would burden our hearts for one another. That, that I, I, I'd ask for a, an atmosphere of intercession, dear God, to arise on us as a church for one another. That, Lord, as we look at the needs of of our brothers and sisters that whether it's just one prayer or a select few of prayers you would place a burden you would trust us dear God with a burden to pray and push through for our brothers and sisters dear God Lord I thank you for the needs that are made and made known dear God but I pray that they are answered dear God Lord I thank you for the extensive list because we are able to come to you and make our petitions known but Lord, I pray that that list gets refreshed each week through answers in prayer, that people are seeing their prayers, their needs answered. All for the glory of Jesus Christ. We pray for our town, dear God, in Bushy. We pray that if we lift his name, if we lift the name of Jesus Christ, he will draw all men unto him. That we pray that the kingdom of Jesus Christ might advance in this time. That it will go further than it has ever gone before. And Lord, if you see it fit to use this church, to use this body, to advance that, then I pray, dear God, that your will would be done. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, we thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Guys, we'll lead us in our second song. Thank you.
going to read uh, from 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 20 verse 1 to 19 um, and I'm, I'm actually reading from the ESV because um, that's the translation I've got in front of me. <clears throat> verse 1. After this the Mo- Moabites and the Ammonites and with them some of the Munites came against Jehoshaphat for battle Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, A great multitude is coming against you from Edom, from beyond the sea, and behold, they are in Hazon Tamar, that is in Gendi. Uh, Then Jehoshaphat was afraid and set his face to seek the Lord and proclaim a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah assembled to seek help um, from the Lord. Sorry, from Judea. And Judea assembled to seek help from the Lord. From all the cities of Judea they came to seek the Lord. And Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judea and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of this nation. In your hand are power and might so that none are able to withstand you. 
Did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it to forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? And they have lived in it and have built for you in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, if disaster comes upon us, the sword, judgment or pestilence or famine, we will stand before this house and before you, for your name is in this house and cry out to you in our affliction and you will hear and save. And now behold, the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came from the land of Egypt and whom they avoided and did not destroy. Behold, they reward us by coming to drive out us out of your possession, which you have given to us to inherit. O oh, our God, will you not execute judgment on them? For we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Meanwhile, all Judah stood before the Lord uh, with their little ones, their wives and their children. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehazel, the son of Zechariah, son of Benaiah, son of Jalel, son of Mataniah, praise God, a Levite of the son of Asaph in the midst of the assembly. And he said, listen, all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, Thus says the Lord, do not be afraid and do not be dismayed at this great horde, for the battle is not yours but God's. Tomorrow go down against them. Behold, they will come up by the ascent of Ziz. You will find them at the end of the valley, east of the wilderness of Jurel. Uh, you will need to fight in this battle. Stand firm. Hold your, sorry, you will not need to fight in this battle. Stand firm. Hold your position and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid, do not be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them and the Lord will help you. Then Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground and all Judah and the heavens of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. And the Levites and the Kothites and the Korites stood up to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. Father, we just thank you for this time where John will share us uh, with us the word. We pray, Lord, that you prepare our hearts uh, to receive uh, what's going to be spoken this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, is in a difficult situation. He's committed to building for a better future, and he's a great example to us of how God would have us all build for a better tomorrow. But at this point in his life, things are going badly for him. He is facing an invasion from the kingdoms of Ammon and Moab. And in the light of that invasion that's coming his way, he's called the nation to assemble for a day of fasting and prayer. And we read just a little while ago in our service what happened when the people came together like that? God raised up a prophet to speak to the people. And the prophecy is recorded in verses 13 to 17. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, and the Lord said, and said, Listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours but God's. Tomorrow will go down against them. They will be climbing up by the pass of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the gorge of the desert of Jerusalem. You will not have to fight in this battle. Take up your positions, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you. O oh, Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, for the Lord will be with you. Now, there are two key elements in that prophecy. There is, first of all, an assurance of victory. In verse 15, do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. The battle is not yours, but God's. And again, in verse 17, you will not have to fight this battle. Take up your position, stand firm and see the deliverance the Lord will give you. There's a clear assurance of victory in this prophecy. But there is also a clear challenge to take risks. So again in verse 17, take up your positions, stand firm and see the deliverance the Lord will give you, O Judah and Jerusalem. 
Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow and the Lord will be with you. A clear promise of victory and a clear challenge to take risks. And we're going to look at those two aspects of this prophecy now. And first of all, we're going to look at the clear promise of victory, the assurance of victory that God gives to Hoshaphat. And the assurance of victory comes in two parts. There is, first of all, a statement that the invasion will fail. So in verse 15, do not be afraid or discouraged. The battle is not yours, but God's. And in 17, you will not have to fight this battle. Take your, your position, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you. Clearly, uh, there is an assurance from God that the invasion will fail. And, and that assurance of victory is meant to take away the fear and the discouragement that the people of Israel are feeling. So twice, in verse 15 and in verse 17, in the prophecy, God says to the people, do not be afraid or discouraged. And, and this assurance of victory is meant to take away that fear and discouragement. Now, fear is the feeling we have that something bad is about to happen. It's a feeling of vulnerability, uh, of being at risk, of being there being the likelihood of harm. And it's emotion we experience when we feel something bad is going to happen to us. It's fear. And again, in terms of discouragement, discouragement is what fear produces. See, when, we're, when we have a feeling that something bad is going to happen to us, then it means we begin to lose heart, we begin to lose hope, we give up any thought of a good outcome. And that's what it is to be discouraged. We're scared that something bad is just about to happen. And as a result, we give up all hope of any good outcome for us in the immediate future. And what God is saying to Jehoshaphat and the people through this prophecy is, look, don't give in to fear. Don't give in to that feeling that the future is going to be terrible for you. And, and don't be discouraged. Don't give up hope of a good outcome despite this invasion. And, and that's why God gives them this, this promise of victory. He, he says, you don't need to be afraid. You don't need to be discouraged. Because in fact, that, that difficult thing that you're expecting won't be happening to you. Now, in the same way that God gave Jehoshaphat and the people an assurance of victory, so for all who follow Jesus, God has spoken in a similar way. John 14, verse 27. Jesus says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let them be afraid. And in Romans 8, 28, all things work together for the good of those whom God loves. And, and in the same way that Jehoshaphat and the people were not to give in to fear, that sense that something terrible was going to happen, and to discouragement, that feeling that there was no good outcome that could possibly be theirs. In the same way that they were not to give way to fear or discouragement, neither are we. We, we may sometimes feel in the situation where we say, oh dear, something terrible is just going to happen. And, and because of that, we, we begin to lose all hope of any good outcome for us. But in Jesus, God says to us, look, don't be afraid. It's peace that I give you. And in all things, the Bible says, God is working for our good. And, and so we should never give in to that fear that something terrible is going to happen and lose all hope of a good outcome. Whatever our circumstance, whatever our situation, we are able to look to God for a good outcome for us. And that's what God was saying through this prophecy to Jehoshaphat. The, the, the invasion will fail. And that there will be a good outcome for you. And God makes a similar promise to all of us who follow Jesus too. But th this assurance of victory uh, included within it as well a statement that the battle was not Jehoshaphat's but God's. So verse 15, do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours but God's. 
Now, the only way that, that these words, the battle is not yours, but God's, the only way that, the only meaning that those words can have is that the responsibility for winning the battle was God's and not Jehoshaphat's. I mean, the battle was Jehoshaphat's in the sense that it was his country that was being invaded and it was he who was responsible for mustering the army to do something about it. But in another much more profound sense, the battle was not his, it was God's, because God was saying that I will take responsibility for you, Jehoshaphat. I know this is a hard day to live in, but you're not living in it on your own. And the truth, Jehoshaphat, for you is this. The battle isn't yours because it is mine, says God. I will take responsibility for you and for your future and for the good outcome that I long to give you. The battle is not yours, but God's. The responsibility for it, Jehoshaphat, is with God and not with you. And in the same way that God spoke that to Jehoshaphat, so he speaks the same word to us today. To all who follow Jesus, Jesus says this, are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Look, don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. And again, drawing on the imagery of birds, Jesus says in Matthew 6, 26, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? And in those sayings, Jesus is telling us that in God's sight, we have great value to him. And just as he cares for the sparrows, just as he takes responsibility for them and their welfare, so for those who follow Jesus, who hold much greater value to God even than sparrows, God will again take responsibility. God's people are God's responsibility. The, the battles in life that we face, we don't face alone. Indeed, the battles are not ours in the sense that it's our responsibility to win them. The battles are God's in that he takes responsibility for us. And so in Romans 8 verses 31 and 32, Paul writes, If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? It's the idea that God, who is for us, is taking responsibility for us and for our future. And as we trust that God is by our side, we will find him fighting life's battles for us. And so for Jehoshaphat and the people, the, the prophecy brought an assurance of victory. First of all, they were not to give way to fear or to be discouraged. They were not to lose hope of a good outcome, but rather God would give them victory. And the reason God would give them victory is because he took responsibility for their battles. And God says the same things to us, that here we are in the midst of COVID, all the economic uncertainties around us, all the difficulties of our lives day by, day by day, it's easy to give way to the fear that something terrible is going to happen. And, and when that fear that something awful is going to happen, it then becomes very hard to hold on to any hope of a good outcome from these days. But God says, look, don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. The battles that you are facing are mine, not yours. I will take responsibility for you, says God, and I will take responsibility for the battles that you face. And that there's a tremendous assurance of victory and a freedom from fear that comes from knowing that God says to us what he said so long ago to Jehoshaphat. Hear these words of Jesus. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Your battles are ones that God takes responsibility for. So there is a clear uh, assurance of victory here. But there is also in this prophecy 
a strong challenge to take risks. So in verse 16, Jehoshaphat is commanded, tomorrow, march down against the invaders. And in verse 17, take up your position, stand firm. And again in verse 17, go out to face them tomorrow. Now, God has said to them, you don't need to be afraid because the battle is not yours, but mine. And in a way, you could, we could excuse the people for thinking, well, OK, then we'll just pack up and go home and everything will be all right. But God says, oh, no, no, the battle is mine, but your, the battle is mine, not yours, but you must still go out to face the enemy. God was challenging his people to still go and face the invading army. The battle was God's. The victory was one that he would give, but the people had to go out and face the army that was invading them. And, and we need to recognise that this call from God to go out, to march out, verse 16, march down against them. Verse 17, take up your positions. Verse 17, go out to face them. This command by God to go and meet the enemy as it begins the invasion, would not at all have been the most obvious military response to the invasion. The, the most obvious response to the invasion would have been to retreat back behind the secure walls of Jerusalem and, and kind of wait and see whether the invading army would have the strength to, to break down Jerusalem's walls. And in fact, that tactic of retreating behind the strong walls of Jerusalem is one that the Jewish nation did adopt in, in uh, future wars that would come to them long after the time of Jehoshaphat. The Assyrians would invade, and then the Babylonians would invade. And on both those occasions, the, the Jewish response that was to go inside Jerusalem, to retreat behind its safe walls and trust Jerusalem and it, its gates and walls to keep them safe. But here God is saying, oh no, guys, you're not to go home and just pretend nothing's happening, nor are you to go and uh, let yourself be besieged in the city of Jerusalem. No, what you need to do the, is to go out and, and face this enemy right now, march out against them before they get anywhere near the city of Jerusalem. So although the battle was gone, God was challenging them to march out and face the invader. Now, the significance of this is very important. You see, if God was going to take responsibility for their battle for them, and if God was going to fight the battle for them, why did God want them to go out and march, to go out and stand firm against the enemy? If God was going to take responsibility for them, why did he want them to, to go out and, in a sense, put themselves in harm's way and go and stand in front of the invading army? Well, the answer to that question is really key to this whole passage of Scripture. The reason God wanted them to go out and take position and face the invaders was that God wanted them to put their faith in him into action. You see, God has said to them, the battle is not yours, but God's. And, and he's saying to them, you can trust me for the victory that you will need in this invasion. And Jehoshaphat and all the people would have heaved a huge sigh of relief. <sighs> okay, we can trust God. We can trust God for victory. But then God says, if you're trusting me for victory, show it by what you do. Go out against the enemy and face them, because in doing that, says God, that's how you will show me that your faith in me is real. And the reason that going out to face the invaders would show God that the people's faith in God was real, was that because when they went out to face the invaders, they were taking a risk. They were putting themselves in harm's way. They were putting themselves in a position where if God didn't turn up, where if God didn't deliver them, then they would be in deep trouble. 
in fact, if, if God didn't fight for them at that moment, chances are that the huge army invading them would slaughter them. And, and so God is saying, look, uh, the battle is not yours, it's mine. And the people saying, that's great. We'll trust God for the victory. Amen. And God says, it's great that you trust me for the victory. What I want you to do now is take a step that shows that you trust me by risking something. But if I don't turn up and give you victory, it will cost you dearly. Now, that's a key principle of faith. When we trust God, there are times when God says, put that trust into action by doing something that is risky unless I come and fight the battle for you. And in fact, that idea of a, a faith that takes risks, a faith that trusts God and, and puts that trust into action by taking risks for God, is something that is in the call of Jesus to all of our lives. Jesus again and again in his earthly ministry called those who put their faith in him to demonstrate that faith by taking risks. So look in Luke 5, 27 and 28, this is the call of Levi to be a, an apostle. The Bible says in verse 27 of Luke 5, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything and followed him. That was a risk. Levi was taking a risk. He left everything to follow Jesus. He may even have left behind the money on the table. And, and it was a risk for him. He heard the call of Jesus. He heard Jesus calling him to faith. In a sense, he heard what Jehoshaphat heard God say through the prophecy. The battle won't be yours anymore, Levi. It will be mine. Come and follow me and trust me for your life. Trust me to walk with you and to fight life's battles with you. Will you do that? And in his heart, Levi was saying, yes, I will. And then Jesus said, OK, up you come and follow me. Put that faith into action now. Take a risk, Levi and trust me, show that you trust me by the risk that you're taking. And Levi got up and followed him. And again, that's something that we see in the life of Peter. Uh, later on, when Peter walks on the water in Matthew 14, verses 26 to 29, the disciples are in a boat on the Sea of Galilee and Jesus is walking on the water toward them. And they think that Jesus is a ghost and they're scared. And in verse 6 of Matthew 14, the Bible says that when the disciples saw Jesus walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it's I, don't be afraid. Well, Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water and came towards Jesus. So here are the disciples, they're afraid, just as Jehoshaphat was afraid at the invading army. And here's Jesus saying to the disciples, don't be discouraged, don't be afraid. And, and God was saying to Jehoshaphat, don't be afraid, don't be discouraged, because the battle is not yours, but God's. And, and again, Jesus is saying, don't be afraid to his disciples, that the battles you face are, are, are not yours, but, but they're mine. And so Peter says, well, okay, if that's really true, let me walk under the water towards you. And so Jesus said, okay, Peter, away you go. Come on now onto the water. Come and take a risk. Come, come and demonstrate your faith in me by the action that you take. And, and take a risk by getting out of that secure boat onto the water to walk to me. And of course, Peter took that risk and walked on the water. Of course, there, there, there was a, a tremendously significant occasion where Peter didn't take that risk. This was when Jesus was arrested and was on trial. And on three separate occasions, people said to Peter, you're one of Jesus' followers, aren't you? And you see, at that point, Peter was called to take a risk. He was called to say, yes, 
I am a follower of Jesus and risk his future on God. But if he owned up to, to being a follower of Jesus, he would be looking to God to, to, to fight his battles for him. But Peter stepped back and, of course, three times denied knowing Jesus and, and wouldn't risk his safety by standing up for Jesus. But here, in this battle that Jehoshaphat is facing, God has, has assured him of victory, and Jehoshaphat and the people have, have believed God for it, and now God is saying, okay, put that faith in me into action by taking a risk, the risk of going out to face this invading army. The battle isn't yours, but God's. You said you believe it. Okay, show me you believe it by putting yourself in harm's way so that if I don't turn up and fight for you, things will go badly for you. If you really believe me, risk that for me. And actually, God looks today for faith that will take risks for him, for faith that will step out and say, I'm doing this for God, but if God doesn't turn up, I'm going to be in trouble afterward. Are you willing to take risks for him? The truth is the battle is not yours. It is God's. And the truth is all th in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. There are times in your life when God asks you, OK, show me that you believe that by taking a risk for me now. And you'll know what that risk is and you'll know whether you're able to take it. And God grant us the, the grace and the faith to take the risks that need to be taken in order to discover God fighting our battles for us. The Lord bless you. So we're going to prepare now for communion as we sing this next song. Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, is in a difficult situation. He's committed to building for a better future.
Um, Dorothy uh, showed us quite uh, uh, graphically last week how uh, memories are important and how objects can help us to remember things. And she went through the, the list of eight items that uh, helped us to remember the word remember. And uh, during the week I, th I thought about that almost daily the eggs and the bowl and the rubber ball, the mat, the ear, the elephant and the mug. Um, and she also uh, brought to our attention poppies, which uh, enable us to remember those that fell in the Flanders uh, fields of, uh, of, um, of Europe uh, all those years ago. God, our creator, is also aware of the psychology of objects to help us remember. And one of the things that uh, he, he did when he set up the tabernacle, he set up a number of objects 
which um, reminded people of certain things. They represented uh, certain things. But also he wanted, pe he wanted his uh, people never to forget that it was he that rescued them from slavery in Egypt. And he instituted the, the feast of the Passover to remember that first past Passover feast uh, when the angel of death passed through. But those who had got the lamb and had done what God had commanded them to do uh, were saved. And every year afterwards, they went through um, a, a similar ritual of sacrificing a lamb and remembering the, the time when the angel of death passed over and they were saved. And gradually over time, things were added to the Passover feast. And when um, Jesus was going to celebrate it with uh, his disciples, it was probably quite a, a long meal and there were more symbols than, than just the lamb that was there. But he took two of the symbols and um, he, he changed, and I'm, I'm quite glad he did change from having a lamb that was slaughtered to represent him to taking bread that was part of that Passover feast. And um, it was fitting that he changed it from a lamb to the bread because he had uh, said during his earthly ministry that he was the bread of the life and that those people that take of this bread will, will never hunger. And Paul picks up the, the, that same theme a number of times in his letters to, to the churches. Um, he said, is, is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? And is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And we know that the early church uh, um, remembered Jesus in this way, uh, probably on a weekly or, or even more frequent basis than that. And so it is, it is fitting that we as, as believers continue to do that. And... Um, I hope in, you, in your own homes that you have got something to represent bread and something to, to represent wine. When Jesus did it, he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, that is the disciples, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of the sins. I tell you, I would not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it uh, anew in the Father's kingdom. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take, eat, this is my body. So together, um, we're going to take the bread that we have, and I've got this loaf, which speaks of Jesus' body, which was given for us. And as we take of it individually, we are taking from that body of Jesus. But in taking it, we become one body as well, one body of believers, because we are God's kingdom. God's kingdom is not something for the future, God's kingdom is now, and we are part of that kingdom, each of us. So let's just take the bread, remembering Jesus, and giving thanks for what he did for us in giving his body. Similarly, as we take um, some drink that is symbolic of uh, Christ's blood, it was wine that he took because that was uh, what people drank a lot of to protect them from, from, from illness. Um, but while we're in church here, we take um, just grape juice and we drink it. But nevertheless, 
It is a reminder of the blood of Jesus that was shed for us on Calvary. So let us give thanks again for his blood. Lord Jesus, as we take these symbols, our hearts just well up with thanks and praise for what you did for us on Calvary. And what you offer us is given freely. We don't have to earn our salvation. We can never earn our salvation. The price of salvation was too high for us to pay. Only the Holy Son of God, you, Lord Jesus, could take away our sins. And we thank you for that today. We thank you from the bottom of our heart. And as we lead our life on a daily basis, may we remember that the price has been paid. Every bit of that price has been paid by you. And may we live our lives in thanksgiving of the sacrifice that you made for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Our service is virtually over now. We're going to have a final song, O oh, Praise His Name.
just close this service. We just want to thank you and magnify your name, Jesus. We thank you for the worship. We, we, we thank you for the word that was brought and the, the comforting reality that Jesus has left us with peace and that God has taken the responsibility for his people. And Lord, in that, in that, in that comforting thought, in that thought of relief, may we also, just like the children of, of Judah did, take that step into putting our faith in action. Lord, in, in this week and in the coming weeks, Father, for everybody that's here, the few that are gathered here, for everybody that's watching on the various platforms, I pray that you bless each and every one of us. And I pray that you, you keep us under the shadow of your wings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, guys. Thank you so much um, for joining. I hope you have a blessed, a blessed week. Um, don't forget that the Zoom breakout sessions follow directly after the end of my voice. Uh, so bless you all. Thank you. Oh, this is so boring. I don't like Christmas like this. I want to go out. I want to go to a I want to go to a pantomime. I want to play with some friends. I want to do some craft. I want to. I want to sing carols. I want to see an activity. I don't like staying home like this. This is so boring in lockdown. Oh, the post. Oh, to chirpy and cheap. I love getting posts. I wonder what's in here. It's an invitation to a Christmas party. A party, a Christmas party. I love a Christmas party. It's at the North Pole. That's fantastic. It says there'll be pies, there'll be games. This is marvellous. They'll be singing songs, there'll be a pantomime. This is amazing. And a nativity. Best of all, there'll be prizes. Oh, and the chance to find out about the greatest gift in the world. This is superb! Chirpy, Chirpy, wake up! Oh, hi, hiya, kids! Oh. Chirpy, the kids are here! Oh, hi. hi, kids! Sorry, I was just having a nap because I had so many mince pies that I felt so full I had to go and doze off for a bit. Well, speaking of mince pies, Chirpy, look! We've got a party invitation. A party? A Christmas party. A Christmas party. At the North Pole. Oh, I can't wait. Will there be pies? Oh, there'll be lots of pies. Mince pies. Well, maybe some pies. Hey, kids, why don't you all join us? Oh, that would be fabulous. Kids, get your grown-ups to register you for our Christmas Madness party on Saturday the 19th of December. We'll be online on Zoom at 10 o'clock in the morning till half past 11. Then in the afternoon, I think we're going to have a Cinderella pantomime show live on YouTube. Oh no we're not. Oh yes we are. Oh that's such good fun. Excellent. And in the afternoon, there will be a nativity tribe from 4.30 till 6. And that's in Oxy Village, right outside Bushy Baptist Church where you might even meet some of the nativity characters. And at the end of the trail, you'll be able to choose a prize from all your hard-earned BB bucks. It's gonna be great. And we'll send you everything you need in a Christmas party bag once you have registered. So make sure you register by using the email address below. Yes, and hurry up. The deadline is the 8th of December. We'll see, see you there. there.